All right. So the sermon for this evening I'll be preaching on is a subject that I think is very needed in the day that we live in. Um, I bring this up frequently just in general, how things are getting more and more wicked. And we see that in many areas, in many aspects. And one of the biggest, one of, one of the ways I think you can like sum up just some of the wickedness just has to do with people's character in general. Just, I was preaching this morning, you know, talking about people don't care about their word. They don't care if they're going to falsely accuse people. They don't care about lying. You know, none of that stuff seems to matter. People don't care these days about making vows, you know, making vow to stay with a man or a woman for the rest of their life. You know, in marriage, people are just, just not caring very much at all what their word is. That's a character flaw. That's something that this generation has, and I, you know, I brought up social media, I brought up all these other things this morning about the way this world is going. But another area, the area I'm going to focus on tonight, where people are really lacking in their char character, is in loyalty and honor. Loyalty and honor. You know, there used to be a thing that, you know, nowadays, if you were to watch anything that's honorable, if you were to try to find a movie or try to find whatever, like, like anything that has to do with someone being noble, someone being honorable, it's going to be really, really old-fashioned. There's nothing anymore these days that seem to be... What's honorable these days, out, you know, in, in, in Hollyweird and whatever they're putting out, is, is people, you know, just sticking up for wickedness. Right? They're going to they're gonna call, oh yeah, he's real honorable and noble for, for defending sodomites or for, you know, whatever. And, and everything's just turned out over on its head. But one thing I think that people are lacking, especially, is loyalty. What does it mean to be loyal to someone? It's to be faithful, loyal. Someone that, that you could be relied on and they, they could rely on you. It's interesting, um, you know, as I, when I was laid off from my job, and I, I started looking for, for a new job, another, another you know, bivocational, not only do I pass our church, I also work a full-time job. And um, it used to be that people would get a job or get employed and stay with one place, one company, They'd stay there for, for decades, right? I mean, you'd work, you'd work hard, you invest your time, you invest in a company, and that's, you know, it's kind of the way you go, and you just work your way up, now, obviously, there's always times where it could make sense to make a move or transition. But in general, and, and by and large, employers were looking for employees to have for, for long periods of time. And it's a good thing to be, to be stable and just working for a company just for a long time. That shows character. That shows loyalty. That shows that you're willing to go with the ups and downs, where you're willing to invest your time in order to see you know, the company succeed, just, just humanly speaking, in that aspect. But these days, what, what I've found is to be way more common is that people just kind of job hop. And they go from this place to this place to this place to this place. And some people even look at that as a good thing. I don't. I think that's more of a character flaw. Like I said, there may be some instances where that needs to be the case. I'm not just speaking just super broad in applying it to every single person. You know, if you've had multiple jobs, you know, when you start off, typically you'll probably have a few more jobs as you're getting your foot in the door trying to get a trade or, or learn some skill somewhere. You know, we all start off with, with some type of work that's going to be, a, you know, some minimum wage job or whatever. But as you, you get towards something you're going to spend your life doing, some type of a career type job, you know, typically you're going to want to stay in a place and just, because and, what are you doing? You're investing your time. That's another character trait, is that you're not just going to work just to punch in, punch out, and it's just like, it's just, it's just a job. Oh man, I got to go to my work. Oh, I got to go to job. And, and I hate it. And I hate everything about it, but I just got to get the time in just so I can get paid. That's a bad attitude to have, first of all. You should be, I mean, if you're going to be investing your time somewhere, you should find a job that you like and works at work doing something that you enjoy doing. And so, you know, one, so that work isn't a drudgery, but you're, you're investing. I mean, what is your time worth to you? you the things that we do in this, I mean, you're, you're investing your life. You're, when you invest your time, you invest your life. You ought to care about the work that you do. What are you producing? Are you working? You know, as the Bible says, you're working for 
uh, you know, your, your master as you were working for Christ. Loyalty. Now, first and foremost, of course, we need to show loyalty to God. God is number one. God is at the top of the chain. You know, we have loyalties to other people. We're going to get into that, just different people we ought to be loyal to. But number one ought to be in your life, God. God is number one. God deserves more than anybody, our undying gratitude and loyalty and honor. And notice that the sermon is loyalty and honor. So what does that mean? When I say honor, I'm talking about respect. I'm talking about staying loyal to someone and respecting them. God deserves both more than anyone else. The Bible says in Titus 1.17, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And I could go, I could preach for hours easily on why God deserves our glory and it deserves his glory. It deserves honor and deserves respect. We could read through the book of Psalms. It's all throughout scripture and, and, and you know, it just, it just makes perfect sense. I don't want to spend a lot of time. I don't think, I don't think that people have too much of a problem with this. Except when it comes to their own sin. Then, then they don't have as much honor or respect for God's word when they want to justify something that in the flesh they want to do. But again, I think that's kind of a different sermon. That's, that's not exactly where I wanted to go with what I'm preaching tonight. Now, one other point, though, as far as giving loyalty and honor unto God, first and foremost, this, this verse um, popped up in my, in my study for the sermon. And I figured I'd just bring it up because of everything that's been going on with these heretics, the modalist heretics that, uh, that seem to be popping up all over the place. John 8, 54, the Bible, Jesus, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me of whom ye say that he is your God. Now, how you can look at that verse and just say, well, yeah, Jesus is the Father is beyond me. That's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. He just gets done saying, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. So when you try to say that Jesus is the Father, you're saying that Jesus' honor is nothing. Because what you're saying is that he dishonored himself. Because Jesus is the Father, so he just, he's just honoring himself. When out of his own lips, he said, well, my honor is nothing if I honor myself. He says, no, my Father, which you say is your God, my Father honors me. And you know, honor is something that you can't bring on yourself. Other people bestow that on you. Honor is something that you give to others. And the only way you could receive it is if someone wants to give honor to you. You cannot force honor upon yourself. You cannot just take honor upon yourself because that's not really honor. That's lifting yourself up. That's having a haughty attitude. To receive honor, you need to just be, uh, have integrity, you know, live a certain way like Jesus did. Jesus was true to God's word. He was true to the word of God. Everything he did pleased the Father. And that is deserving honor and glory and respect. And that's why Jesus Christ is the name above every name. That at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We need to remain loyal to Jesus Christ. Now, and, and you could, again, another direction you could take was staying loyal to God, staying loyal to Jesus as you go through all throughout the Bible where you, talk, where you hear God talking about not going after strange gods, right? Not going after idols, not going after idolatry. Why? Because God is a jealous God and he wants you, he wants your attention and your devotion to him and not to any other so-called God. But the part, what I really want to focus more on today are other areas I have to bring that up first because God deserves our loyalty and honor over everybody else, again. And, and whenever there's a conflict, as I, as I start talking about people that we should have loyalty and honor for, 
Just always remember when there's a contradiction or a conflict between any person and God, God always wins out. God is deserving of the utmost loyalty, of the utmost honor. So if I'm talking about someone today, if I'm going to refer to someone that is deserving of our loyalty, right, of you being faithful to them and staying close to them, if there comes a point where there's a contradiction between that person, where if in order for you to remain loyal to them, you have to break loyalty with the Lord, you do not break that loyalty with the Lord. You have to stay loyal to God. You would have to break that loyalty to that person. So just, just bring that up right off the bat. Make sure you understand that because I'm going to be talking a lot about how important it is to stay loyal to people. Just as much as people are, you know, getting married and getting divorced, they're not staying loyal to their spouses. People are doing that even with friends. Kids these days are doing that with friends. They just kind of like friend swap. They don't stay loyal. They just, whoever, whoever suits their need at the time, very convenient for them, that's who they become friends with. It's a me, me, me type of a, of a, of a generational focus and not a what can I do for others type of mindset. Turn if you would, well, no, keep, never mind. We're going we're gonna to go through 1 Corinthians 4. There's a lot of things I want to cover in this chapter. This is a great chapter that kind of outlines this. Now, the church at Corinth had a lot of problems, and you get that as you read through 1 and 2 Corinthians. You see, you know, Paul rebuking the church at Corinth for all kinds of different things. They had, they had heretics, they had divisions, they had lots of issues at the church of Corinth. They even had people there that were um, being very critical of the Apostle Paul, they were kind of saying, oh, yeah, he's real weighty. You know, his letters sound real weighty and powerful, but when, you know, when he's actually here in presence, he's not going to be that tough, right? He's not going to be that much of a tough guy. And they kind of would ridicule him or mock him and not give him the honor and the respect that he deserves because there were people there that were lifting themselves up and thinking themselves to be someone and not giving the Apostle Paul the respect that he deserved. So let's keep that in mind as we read this because this is who this is addressed to in general. It's a, it's a church at Corinth. Look at verse number one here in 1 Corinthians chapter four. The Bible says, let a man so account of us. Now, this is obviously picking up in the middle. What he just got done with in chapter three, just look at verse number 22. He says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ's and Christ is God's. And uh, just a little bit up before that, just to give you more context, he says, uh, verse 18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, they may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. And then he goes on, whether Paul, Paul, see, you know, basically he's saying, Well, that whole chapter talks about, you know, being wise in the Lord. The world's going to look at you as being foolish, but we need to be wise in the Lord. And he says, whether it's Paul or Paul, Paul it doesn't matter who it's coming from. He says, all are yours. Ye are Christ and Christ is God's. And he's kind of grouping these great teachers together and, um, you know, putting them in order here. You know, that, that whether it's Paul, Paul, Eve, it's the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things that come, all yours, you are Christ, and Christ is God's. And then he, then he continues on there in chapter 4, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So these teachers are like the Apostle Paul. He says, you know, account of us that we are stewards of the mysteries of God. We have the mysteries of God in our hand. We have the Bible. And we are stewards of this. We are responsible for how we deal with the word of God. And he says, you have to account of us that way. He says, it is required, verse number two, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And faithful is just another word for loyal, dependable, faithful. You could put faith in somebody that God can give us his mysteries. He could give us this knowledge in his word and he needs to find his stewards to be faithful. They need to be reliable. They need to be dependable. They need to stay loyal to God. They need to stay loyal to his words. That is our job. We need to have this trait with God's word of staying loyal. 
And he says in verse 3, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. He's saying it's actually a very small thing that I should be judge of you or man's judgment. It doesn't really matter that much to Paul. See, in order to stay faithful or loyal to God and to God's word and the mysteries of the Bible, you can't care what other people think about you. Because I don't care about man's judgment. That doesn't really matter to me because the judgment I care about is from above. I care more about what God thinks about me. I care about what God thinks about the way that I handle his word, about how I teach, than I do about what anyone else thinks about me. It's a, little, it's a very small thing for me what other people think. And that's what he's saying here. We need to have this attitude. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. He said, God's the one who's going to judge me. That's the one who I have to worry about. That's the one who I have to stand before. He's the one who gets the ultimate loyalty and faithfulness and respect is God. More than anybody else. Let's keep reading here. Verse number five. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praises of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So what he's going to go on and continue to explain here, and this, is, this ties in perfectly with what I was preaching this morning as well. We shouldn't be lifting up any person too high and, and just elevating the status of one person more than is reasonable, more than is right. Because then you start getting into this territory where we're going to care more about this, what, what this one person says than you care about what God says. Jonathan, go sit down right now. And he's going to explain here. Well, let's just look at this because he's saying, ultimately, what's the big difference, right? He's saying, these aren't my things. This isn't like I'm not preaching my own stuff. Paul's not preaching his own word. He's preaching God's word. So in that regard, does it really matter who Paul is? Does it matter who Apollos is? Does it matter who Cephas is? They are messengers. They, they are doing a job. They are stewards of the mysteries of God. So they're just doing that work. And anybody, if they're doing their job right, is just going to be promoting the word of God. That's what they care about. They don't care what people think. They don't care what anyone else thinks. And we need to just remember, you can have someone who's a very good steward. And someone that's deserving of loyalty and deserving of honor because they're a good steward. But let's be careful not to elevate too high that steward. And remember, it's God's word, not the steward's word. The steward's just performing a job. Someone's doing a really good job, deserving of praise and credit, sure. But let's not forget the, the who's, who deserves all the, the ultimately who deserves all the credit. Look at verse number seven. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what is thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou, didst not, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? And this is talking about people, you know, people come up with these teachings and they want to they wanna wow you with their knowledge and get up and be like, oh, what, you know, and, and expect to receive this glory and honor and people to lift them up because, oh, you're so smart, and I've never heard that before. And what, you know, this, whatever doctrine, whatever new thing that you're teaching, you know, he's saying, look, what do you have that you didn't receive? Because any knowledge that we have, we've received from the Lord. God's given us that knowledge. If I'm reading my Bible, which happens regularly, you know, you read your Bible, and then something's just opened up to you, and you say, wow, I never really fully understood that before. Now I understand that a lot better. God's opened up your understanding. God has given you that knowledge. Or maybe you're sitting in here and preaching that on a passage, a similar type of a thing. Wow, I never saw that before. The preacher just pointed out something that I hadn't seen in the scripture before, but that's good, that's true, that's right. You received that from someone else. But what happens is there's certain people that don't care about what's right. They don't care about just being a good steward. They care about what people think about them. So now they're going to take that and just espouse it as if, oh, this is all my, I came up with all this and I'm so smart. He's saying, why would you glory? 
How could you glory over something that you, that you didn't come up with on your own, that you, that you didn't just receive from someone else? There's no way you could glory over that. Verse number eight, let's keep reading here. Now ye are full, now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And as we're going to keep reading here, he's going to explain, look, the, who are better ministers of God's word than the apostles? You know, I mean, you had some great men of God throughout history. You have Moses and Abraham and David. You know, we have, we have certain people, but all these apostles, you know, at, at once going around teaching the word of God, they were great men of God, but look at what he says about them and how they were viewed and how they were treated and, and how the world looked at them and everything else. It wasn't an easy life from the world's perspective. Now, they would probably tell you, even though they went through persecutions, even though they had trials and tribulations, that they probably, they probably have a good attitude and say, yeah, it really wasn't that bad because it's all worth it because they weren't minded just about the things that are happening in the near term, in the short term, in their flesh. They're, they're thinking about heavenly things. And they set their affections on things above, not on things in the earth. So when you do that, when you have that mindset, it's a lot easier to get through those things and you don't feel like it's that big of a deal. But let's keep reading here what he says. He says, um, verse number 10, We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Now, He's speaking to people who, in general, were not really right with God. Like, when, when you're living right, like the Apostle Paul was and like these other apostles were, you are despised. You know, you're not ruling. You're, you're, you're counted as fools. He's saying, hey, you guys are wise. You know, you guys are strong. You're honorable, but we're despised. Verse number 11, even under this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, I mean, people lying about you and lying about your character and just, just speaking all kinds of falsehoods about you, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the off-scouring of all things unto this day. Notice some of the people who are doing the most and best work, the best stewards who ought to be held in high regard by man, who ought to be honorable, who are deserving of honor and loyalty. He's saying it's basically the exact opposite. He's saying we're, we're looked on as the filth, the off-scouring of the world. We're looked on as just less than, than nothing. You know, we're looked on as just these really uh, bad people, whatever. Now, we know that the world is going to look upon men of God, stewards of God's word in that fashion. We know that. But God forbid that that's the attitude among God's own people when it comes to good stewards of God's word. When people are siding with the world, when they're not staying loyal to the steward of God and to God, yet they're turning their back. They're giving dishonor and they're despising God's word. They're despising the stewards of God's word who are handling God's word well. They don't care. What a shame that is when a Christian, when a believer is going to take that type of an attitude and just side with the world. Let's keep reading here. He says in verse number um, 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. So I'm not telling you all this stuff to shame you. That wasn't, he's like, that's not the goal. He said, but I'm warning you. And what's he warning him? He's warning him about all the bad things that happen that they're, you know, they're considered the filth of the world, all this other stuff. Because if they get right with God and start actually doing what's right, it's going to happen to them too. I'm warning you. And notice he says, as my beloved sons. Why is he calling them his beloved sons? Because he won them to the Lord. He won them to Christ. The Apostle Paul was an evangelist. He was out preaching the gospel. He was out getting people saved and getting churches started all over the place. 
all over the world. He was traveling around, establishing churches, getting people saved. And he followed up with them, writing letters to them, you know, instructing Timothy and Titus and probably some other people as well. I don't know, um, but definitely those two to ordain pastors and these churches. And then he'd go back around sometimes and just check up on them and see how they're doing. He wrote two epistles to the church of Corinth, at least two, two epistles that were scripture for sure. And he says, I, I, um, he says, my beloved sons, I warn you, verse number 15, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, there are many people I could teach you the Bible. There are many people you could learn from. You could learn from, you could learn from just about any, but any other believer, you could probably learn something from. You could learn even from a child. You could have 10,000 instructors. He says, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So he explains what he means. You don't have very many fathers. He's talking spiritually. Why is he talking spiritually like that? Because he's the one who led them to Christ. And this is a big flaw amongst people who are believers that they don't stay loyal to the person who basically brought, you know, traveled in birth with them to help bring them to Christ. You see, in mo that's why we talk about getting people saved. Because the Apostle Paul talked about getting people saved. He talked about laboring and traveling and, you know, uh, preaching the word, getting in the yoke with Jesus and, 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 um, and working and plowing and watering and doing the work to bring forth that new life. Now, it wasn't only under Paul's power that these people got saved. Of course, Jesus Christ is the power that saves. But without a person, without a minister, without someone sowing the seed, without somebody plowing the ground, without somebody watering, it's not going to happen. The life is not going to come forth. So what he's explaining is because of his work, because he had to be involved, just like Jesus has to be involved, he's the one that's, that's bringing them forth. He's getting them saved. And there's nothing wrong with that terminology. He uses it even here. But he explains to them, look, you can have a lot of instructors in Christ. You can learn a lot from a lot of different people. You go ahead and read some books. Go ahead and, and listen to other preachers. Listen to Timothy. Listen to Apollos. Look at, listen to Barnabas. Listen to these guys that are great men of the faith. But you know what? You've got one father. And that's early, you know, in 1 Corinthians, you see... Um, in the, in the first chapter, you know, I'm of Cephas, I'm of, uh, of Apollos, you know, uh, I'm of Jesus. And they're, and they're just kind of saying, you know, oh, I follow this person. And they were lifting up certain, certain people above others. That was not right. And they were divided because of they were just following man. And he's saying, like, was, was Apollos crucified for you? You know, like, what, did, did I die for your sins? No, we're, we're followers of Christ, as he was trying to explain but um, even though you have all these different people, he's like, if anybody, you should follow me. You should follow the Apostle Paul. I'm the one that brought you forth. I'm the one who, who spiritually helped give birth to you. But they don't have that loyalty that they ought to have for, their, for you know, one of their spiritual parents, as it were. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you. So he's kind of saying, like, in a way, beseech is like, I'm begging you. Look, look, I beseech you. Be ye followers of me. And this, you see this all the time out, you know, out soul winning. You could lead someone to Christ. And then if you, like, sometimes you'll see, you'll ask them, well, hey, do you want to come to our church? Or, you know, oh, I got a church I go to. It's like, I just led you to the Lord. Your other church didn't do that. I did. I showed you the truth. I explained it to you. You know, you may have many instructors, but you don't have many fathers. You ought to come and be a follower and, be in, and come along with us. I brought you the truth. And there's people nowadays... And you see it all, I've seen it a bunch of times, who they get saved, they get on board, they start hearing hard preaching, they love it, and then one thing happens, they don't like something that their spiritual father, as it were, the way that the, Paul's using it here, they don't like something he says, just like these people, that Paul probably said something to offend some of the people, 
And now they're like, oh, I don't want to have nothing to do with Paul. Who's Paul anyways? And just no regard, no respect, no honor, even though he's a good steward. No character, no loyalty. We need to have more loyalty. Again, first and foremost to God. But you know what? Even when the, when the Apostle Paul was wrong, because I guarantee he was wrong in some instances, not that we see in Scripture because the Scripture is true, but um, we, saw, we see in Scripture some actions that he's made that were wrong. He's still worthy of being followed. He didn't do or say anything that would make you have to choose, no, I have to retain my loyalty to God as opposed to man and just not be able to follow you anymore. Nobody is perfect. So if, you, if you're looking for a man to follow that's going to have perfection, you won't be able to follow anybody. Yet the Apostle Paul saying, hey, be a follower of me. In another, era, in another portion of Scripture, it says, follow me as I follow Christ. It's like, hey, we're examples. We're trying to set the lead for you. Stay loyal. But so many people these days have no concept of loyalty. What does that even mean? They're so quick to just drop this person, drop that person, don't care. It's like, oh yeah, you came to me with love and preached me the gospel and got me saved, but you said this that I don't like, so I'm just going to go find someone else to, to learn from. Yeah, someone, someone else who doesn't do any soul winning, right? Someone else who doesn't love anybody, go out to preach a gospel to them. That's going to be your new teacher. You're going to find some online ministry to minister unto you by, by making some stupid videos that they sit around all day and, and don't do anything for anybody other than just make videos. And that's where you get your doctrine from. When you have someone else who actually went and knocked on your door or, or loved you enough to give you the gospel and get you saved. It's wicked. Let's keep reading here. Verse 17, For this cause have I sent unto you Demotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. This is, we're going to read this again. It's a very important verse. He's saying, you know, right after he got done saying, be a follower of me, he's saying, I want you to be a follower of me. Why? Because other people have crept in already and have been spreading false gospels, spreading false doctrines, you know, bringing in some garbage, some heresies. There's divisions in the church. There's people who aren't, who aren't listening and they're starting to just go off and not be a follower of Paul. But notice what he says in this verse, verse 17. So this is why he sent Timothy. Timothy is another one of his spiritual children. He won Timothy to Christ. But Timothy is faithful. Timothy was a good follower. Timothy was, you know, one of Paul's right-hand men. He listened to him. He learned from him. Just like every great leader in the Bible, you see leaders having other people learning from them, staying faithful to them, staying loyal to them. I think about Elijah and Elisha. Look how faithful, look how loyal Elisha was. And he was blessed for it. When Elijah was about to be taken away and, and caught up into heaven, he was telling, oh, no, you can just stay here, Elijah. Elijah was like, no, I'm staying with you. He's dedicated. He's loyal. I, I don't care what happens. I'm going to be with you. I'm there. I'm, and, and because of his faithfulness, because of his dependable, because of his loyalty, because of his honor, that's why God bestowed honor upon him. That's why when he says, okay, Elijah's like, you know, let, what, what do you want? You've stuck through to the end, as it were. What do you want? What can I do for you? He wanted a double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah. So you've asked a hard thing. He, was, he, was, he said his height's pretty high because Elijah was a great man of God. He, did a, he was used of God tremendously. But Elisha got that blessing. Why? Because he was faithful. He was loyal. He was there. Was Elijah perfect? Nope. nope. But did that make Elisha just, oh, I'm leaving? No. He stayed with them. He stayed the course. 
So many people, you think of Moses and Joshua, you think, you know, people who served, people who were there, people who remained loyal. That's where the honor is going to come in. But nowadays, people want to just bring honor upon themselves. They say with their lips that they're going to stay loyal to God, but their heart is far from Him. These people who, who change at the drop of a hat. Just, oh, I, you know, they're, they're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Little children in the faith. And those would be the people who I think are saved that just get tossed around. I've seen it happen I don't know how many times. People get excited. Oh man, this is the best church ever. Oh man, I love this. I get excited. And then it's like two months later, they're gone. Got saved, got excited, gone. Because they got offended or whatever. No loyalty, no honor. Just heading out. So he says, I, send, I sent Timothy, verse 17, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ. And notice he says, into my ways, not all of his ways necessarily, he says, but my ways which be in Christ. You know, the things that I do that, that are in Christ, that are right, that are good, that are true, they're, he's going to bring you back into remembrance because you apparently you've forgotten these things. So you need someone to remind you, no, these are the ways that Paul taught you in Christ. As I teach everywhere in every church. He said, I teach these things everywhere. Why? Because they're true. Because it's right. And you need to be brought back into remembrance because you've strayed too far from the right path. O Corinthians. Verse number 18. Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. And this is what I was referring to a little bit earlier. You know, they're, getting, they're getting arrogant. They're getting prideful. They're getting puffed up as if he's not going to come. Verse number 19, But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. So they're speaking all these great swelling words, right? And they're talking down about the Apostle Paul. Oh, yeah, he's not going to, you know, if he comes here, his letters are weighty, but in presence, you know, he's weak. That's what they were saying about him. And they're saying all these things just real proud and lifted up. As if, yeah, he's not going to do anything. Who's the Apostle Paul? He's like, well, when I come, I'm not going to know just their words. They're like the keyboard warriors, right? That's exactly what they are because they're saying these things while Paul's away. They're, say, they're all puffed up in themselves. Oh, yeah, who's this? They're, they're the, they're these, they would probably call themselves valiant men, right? That's what they would call it because they're real tough when they're super far away, when a real man of God is really far away from them, yeah, that's when they become real puffed up. But he said, you know what? I, I don't care to hear the words that they say. We'll see what power they actually have. They don't have any power. They're lifted up. God's going to bring them down. He said, they don't have power. I'll understand what their true power is. I'll understand if they're actually walking in the Holy Spirit or not when I come. And he gives them this warning. He says, verse number 20, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? It's your choice. You're going to get right with God now? Are you going to shape up? Are you going to give respect where respect is due? Am I going to come with a rod, you know, to discipline and to chastise and to rebuke? Or am I going to come in love? Spirit of meekness. See, the Apostle Paul was a humble man, but what's right is right. And if you're going to be a leader, you know, you, you could remain meek and not proud, because that's the opposite. The antonym of meekness would be, would be pride. But still stand for integrity and loyalty and honor, where honors do and still command respect because he deserves it. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 
We need to show loyalty and honor to the man of God. Just as we see here with the Apostle Paul, this is something that people used to do in Bible days, you know, way, way back even into the Old Testament, let alone, we're going to read from the New Testament in a minute, but even in 1 Samuel chapter 9, when Saul and his servants are going to seek out Samuel and they're just trying to get information, remember the asses were lost, they, they had to go out and try to find him. So then after looking for him for a while, they're like, hey, there's a prophet here, there's a seer. We're going to go, we're going to go talk to the seer. I'm going to read this passage for you. When they go to speak to Samuel to try to get some guidance, try to get some wisdom, try to get some help in finding, hey, where did these asses go? Where should we look? Can you help us out? You're a man of God. And what people would do, what their custom was, what their tradition was, is that they would respect the man of God. They would respect the prophet. They would respect the preacher. Why? Because he was deserving of it. So what they would do is they would bring something, some type of a gift. Now, look, I'm not saying this because I'm saying you need to give me a gift if you want advice from me. What I'm saying is that that's what the people did because they showed honor unto him. They respected him. They held him in high regard. They didn't talk down to Samuel. They didn't talk down to the man of God. They didn't come to him with this big attitude and this puffed up spirit. Oh, well, who makes you very just as Janus and Jambres? Well, who is this Moses? Why should we follow him anyways? Even Aaron and Miriam got caught up in this, and that's when Miriam became a leper. Well, who's Moses anyways? Aren't we all, like, aren't we all just believers? Aren't we all just the same? Aren't we all brothers in Christ? Well, not when God has ordained a leader, not when God has a specific man of God doing a job. You know what? They deserve honor. They deserve respect. 1 Samuel 9, 6, the Bible says, And he said unto him, Behold, now there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Let, now let us go thither. Peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? He said, okay, let's go ask him, but what are we going to bring him? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Now, they didn't have much. A fourth part of a shekel of silver is not like some great amount of money. But what they're doing is they're just showing him respect. They're showing some reverence. They're showing some honor unto the man of God. They're just bringing him. So bringing him a little gift. Bring, you know, hey, can you help me out? Here, I, I, I'm, I'm showing you some respect. But what people want to do these days is they come into church. What can you do for me? What programs do you have? They call the pastor at all hours of the night. Oh, I have this problem. Oh, I have this problem. They expect you to just kind of be Mr. Fix-It for everything. And it's fine to get counsel and advice. And I encourage counsel and advice some, you know, from people. But the problem oftentimes is with the attitude. And I'll tell you this right now, the man of God is not going to be very willing to help you when you treat him like dirt. It's not going to happen. Now, there are times, and it's not because they're proud or think just so highly of themselves, but, you know, people need to learn a lesson on their own, too, on, on how you just treat other people. I mean, even when it comes to, to speaking with, with elders these days, not even a man of God, just talking to someone who's older, you know, children have no respect at all anymore. They show no respect for other adults. I, when I was growing up, you had to respect every adult. It didn't matter who it was. When you're a child and you're talking to an adult, it's yes, sir, yes, ma'am, excuse me, you know, thank you, all the manners. Why? Because you're showing respect unto them. I mean, and that's, that's taught in the Bible. That, that, you know, you give honor and respect unto the hoary head, you rise up, and, that, and that, um, you, that's how you deal with people. You honor them, you respect them.
1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 1 says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat, entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. Now, I've covered this verse in previous sermons. And as you continue on, I do believe that on a certain, you know, this is, this is referring to an older man, just an older person, right? An, uh, an elder person and treat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. In the context, it's talking about an older man and younger men, right? However, this verse still applies to a spiritual elder as well as a pastor, because you have physical, which, th uh, you know, this, that's what in context this verse is talking about. Rebuke not an elder, and treat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. It's talking about men. Older men, younger men. But it still applies spiritually. It, and it makes perfect sense. You rebuke not your spiritual, you don't, you don't just go and rebuke the pastor, but you entreat him as a father. And the younger men as brethren. So people who are spiritually younger, you, you still treat them as a brother. You don't treat them as anything less. They might be newly saved, but they're still a brother or sister in Christ. But why do you rebuke not the elder? Because you're showing respect. It doesn't mean you can't point out error. It doesn't mean you can't try to offer some type of a correction, but you do so by entreating them as a father. And the reason why it says as a father is because it ought to already just be known that you're supposed to respect your father and your mother. You're supposed to honor your father and mother like the Ten Commandments says. You honor them, you respect them. There should be no way you would ever do anything or say anything you know, uh, against your parents. The Bible says, you know, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God hath given, giveth thee. It also said, Jesus said, um, he was quoting the Old Testament when he was rebuking the Pharisees. He was quoting the Ten Commandments. He says, you know, honor thy father and thy mother. And he says, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. Because that's also written. Because God is very serious about respect and honor for those that are deserving of it. And God says that your parents deserve honor and respect. And he says, if you curse your parents or if you hit them, if you smite them, he said, that's worthy of the death penalty. That's how much God values honor, respect, where it's due, where it's deserving. And your parents... They deserve your on, the honor and respect because they're raising you. So you rebuke not an elder and treat him as a father. And then jump down to verse number 17. The Bible says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So you know what? The, uh, the elders get honor because they're out an elder. But if you're working hard, if the elder's working well, they're, they're doing good, they're working real hard, they're worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. The elders that are, that are working hard, they're studying the Bible, they're, they're, they're doing their best to try to feed the flock, to watch over the church. They are worthy of double honor. Verse number 18, For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. It's what's right. Yet people today just... They, they have this fast food mentality. I just want everything my way. Just, 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 just nope. I want a pastor that, that fits my bill and a church that, that's there for me and just fits everything I want. Everything, just, just check off your list. Well, that like, like you're some consumer. Well, in church, you're not supposed to be a consumer. You're supposed to be a giver. You're there to help others, not to consume. You're there to give. And I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about giving of yourself, giving of your service to the Lord. That's why a church, that's why I call a church service. I'm serving you. When you come in, it's supposed to be a ministry. We're going to minister to others. We're going to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to minister the truth to people. It's a service-oriented role, not a consumer type of a role here at church. People need to have loyalty. They need to be dependable. 
Uh, I mean, I'll tell you this right now, and I'm, I'm not ashamed of this one bit, and I think more people need to be like this. Unless some very grievous or serious thing comes up with any of my friends right now, but especially like Pastor Anderson and Pastor Romero and Pastor Jimenez are really good friends of mine. I mean, really good friends of mine. Pastor Anderson has done so much for me, just in general, in my life. He's, he's deserving and worthy of honor and respect. He's taught me a lot. Now, there may be things I disagree with him on. There may be things that I disagree on how he handles things. There may be some things I disagree with on, in other areas, maybe in certain doctrines. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to remain loyal to my friend, someone who's, who's a good steward of the Word of God, someone who is doing a great work. And I'm going to remain loyal to that person. If there's something that happens that I, you know, I don't like or I don't agree with, I'm still going to stay loyal to him. Unless it's something that gets so grievous just like against God that I have to make a stand and be like, you know what? No, I'm standing with God because he's just totally contradicting God. Then my loyalty lies with God. But apart from that, I'm staying loyal. And that's the way that, that's the way that people should be, especially with good stewards of the word of God. Stay loyal. The last point I'm going to turn to here, turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's the last, last place I'll have you turn. People need to have loyalty and honor for your family, just your family in general, and especially your parents. We kind of covered your parents already, and your spouse, your husband, your wife. You need to stay loyal. This is important today. People have no respect. People have no loyalty. People aren't treating others with the respect that they deserve. The respect that God lays out in Scripture. Elders are worthy of honor. And if they're working hard, they're worthy of double honor. I think Proverbs 30 describes this generation pretty well. The Bible says that you don't have to turn to Proverbs 30, 11 says there's a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There's a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. That's the generation that we have right now. They don't care what their parents, they, they curse their parents. They're pure in their own eyes. They're not washed from their filthiness. They just think that they're just fine. And they're lifted up with pride. No, there needs to be respect and honor in the home. Parents need to be respected by children. And not only that, you ought, to stay you ought to be loyal to your family. And again, if your family is causing you to try to break loyalty with God, loyalty remains with God. That's fine. Then you, have to break, you might have to break loyalty with family for God. But unless it's something like that, you know, it should be God, your own immediate family, which would be your own wife and your, or your husband, and then the rest of your family members. In that order. If your family is trying to get you to break your loyalty to your husband or to your wife, you know what you do? You break your loyalty with your family. In that situation. If your husband or your wife is trying to break their, your loyalty with God, you have to stay with God. Now you try not to break any loyalty when possible. Or try to make them all work. But God, marriage, the rest of your family. Honor and respect. Of course, let me turn there real quick because I wasn't even really going to go into the, the wife aspect of this. There's, a, there's the verse I'm looking at, is verse number seven, this has to do with the husband. But, um, but, but it's important for both. Verse number seven says, likewise, ye husbands dwell with them, talking about the wife, according to knowledge, 
giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So the wife ought to be giving reverence to her husband, as Ephesians chapter 5 says, that, and let the wife see that she reverence her husband, showing respect, showing honor, because that's what the Bible says is do. And I'm just going to pause here real quick, just so we understand respect and honor. The way that you relate that to anything else, because it's not like the definition of the word is going to change. How would you talk to God in general? I mean, just, just how would you... If you're going to show honor to God, think about the things you might say or think about things you wouldn't say. Now, if you're going to give honor or respect to somebody else, what would you say or what would you not say? It's not that hard to do. I mean, I think we have a tendency sometimes to justify things and say, oh, yeah, but they were being this way or they said that, but does that make it okay to, to just lose the honor that, that God says that we, should, we ought to have. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wives as unto the weaker vessel. We ought to honor our wives. We ought to, to, to do things because they are weak, and not just that. He says, being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. They're also, you know, because the wife is supposed to be submissive to the husband, if you have a godly wife, it might be easy to start taking advantage of and really demean your wife. But you got to remember, you're heirs together of the grace of life. God has established an order of authority, and that ought to be followed. And, but there also ought to be respect there and just the remembrance we are still brothers and sisters in Christ and that we're going to be heirs together of the grace of life and, and treat and, and have that mindset with your spouse, with your husband and with your wife, likewise, to, to retain the integrity and the honor that deserves to be there. We'll read now just real quick the, the first part of 1 Peter 3 because... I didn't have my notes, but it's just important to go over. Likewise, ye wives, verse number one, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorn themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So those first six verses talk about wives being submissive and be showing respect as Sarah did. Sarah's brought up as a good example saying, hey, she called Abraham Lord. She called him boss. Right? She was showing respect. She was submissive. She asked him what she was to do and would call him Lord. And didn't boss him around and tell him what to do. She showed respect. And likewise, for the husbands, we need to dwell with the wives according to knowledge and give honor unto the wife. Hey, you honor your wife, when you, especially, you know, when it's talking about her being the weaker vessel, we need to take care of our wives. You can't just, you know, well, I mean, one way to, to not honor your wife is just send them off to work, right? No, they're the weaker vessel. Let them, let them run things at home with the children and the household, what God has already ordained for them to do. And then, you know, recognize that they're weak in certain areas, that they're the weaker vessel and men are stronger. So when you get home and there's, there's things that need to be done, especially that require strength, right? Honor them by doing those things that require the strength. But hey, they're weaker. I'll take care of that. Right? I mean, it's just one way. And it's being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. And finally, when it comes to, when it comes to marriage, I mean, the most important thing to have is loyalty. Staying together, no matter what. 
it's important that you could have that trust with your spouse that, you know, I mean, obviously people have the good times and bad times and, you know, things go well, things don't go so well. You need to be able to rely on each other to be loyal or faithful to one another. And it's a really wicked thing to let, to let the words come out of your mouth as if you're not going to be loyal to them, as if you're not going to be faithful, as if you're just going to leave or whatever. We need to maintain at least that sense of security, knowing that, you know, whether in good times or in bad, it's just, it's just like a renewal of your vows all the time or whenever, or not all the time, hopefully not, I have to be all the time, but it's whenever, you know, whenever you have bad times, you think about those things and say, you know what, I already promised that I'm going to be with her until death do his promise. I have that mindset, so I'm not going to go and, and threaten with just leaving someone because I don't like the way things are going right now because, because we're going through a bad time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be faithful to my word because, one, that's what God commands. I'm not going to go back on my vow. This is how I treat this relationship. And I'm here, and I meant what I said, and, and, and I'm going to stick with it. Even if everyone else around me is, is getting divorces and breaking their word, I will not. I will remain loyal. I'm going to remain loyal to God. I'm going to remain loyal to the man of God. And I'm going to remain loyal to my spouse. It's an important character trait to have. And kids, remember that. You should, you should be loyal to your friends. It's a good friend. It's someone that you can rely on. The Bible says a, fr a neighbor that is close is better than a brother that is far away. That, there, that, that you could have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. They were loyal. David and Jonathan is a great example of good friends. Really good friends. They were loyal to each other. They made an oath with each other. You know, hey, Jonathan saw the writing on the wall. He saw David was going to be the king. He's like, David, just, you know, we're friends. I love you. You know, I'll give you the shirt off my back. I'll, you know, I'll do anything for you. You're a great friend. But just don't, you know, don't wipe out my house. I know you're going to come into power. I know you're going to be king. I know God chose you. But, you know, show mercy unto my house. And he did, and he swore an oath. Why? Because in those days, and I'm not going to get into all this, but you know, usually when, when a change of power would happen, what would happen is the new king is going to make sure there's no threats to his, to his power. So he would secure his place and his position by wiping out anyone who might have a contention with him as to who's the rightful person that needs to be in power. And David said, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because he was loyal to his friend. They were loyal to each other. And it was righteous. If you struggle in that area, make, try, try, to, try to get that right. I mean, who you are boils down to not how much money you have. It's not a financial status. It's what you do. That's who defines who you are. Are you loyal? Would, would people say, yeah, I know that person. They're real loyal. They're dependent. I could rely on them for things. They're real faithful. If not, you should think about working on that. Decide that I'm going to be someone who can be trusted, who can be relied on, first and foremost by God and then by, by other people around me, parents, family, spouse, whoever it may be. Let's bow our eyes over a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you would please help us in our, in our own characters to, to strengthen the good qualities that are espoused in your word. Help us to be more loyal and faithful and dependable, dear God. And um, I pray that you would please just, just help us all with that. We all, we all struggle with our flesh. And I pray that you please help us to be able to walk in the Spirit and to treat our word as being something that's actually important, that when we say things, that, that as you speak, your words come to pass, that we could look to you for the perfect example that when we speak, we ought to make sure that our words come to pass as well, that we treat them very, very carefully and that we, in, in so doing, we could be found faithful to our words and to our friends and to our families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.